In 1918, the final year of the Great War, the German military high command attempted one final large-scale offensive on the Western Front. The ultimate failure led to an increasingly sweeping series of successes by the Allies from the summer of 1918 onwards. As trench warfare continued, the war gave birth to new weapons of destruction, the tank. They were first used during the Battle of the Somme on the 15th of September 1916, with varied but still remarkable results. Many broke down, but almost a third succeeded in breaking through. It was the first time tanks had ever been used in military conflict. They would play an extremely important role as they increased mobility on the Western Front and eventually broke the stalemate of trench warfare. In the March of that year, 1918, the Germans had attacked and pushed the army right back to the Somme, especially the 5th, 5th Army. And the Welsh troops could be spread out through many battalions of the British Army, but in particular the 53rd Welsh Division and the um, Royal Welsh Fusiliers and the Monmouthshire Regiment in particular, of which my father was part of, were just getting ready for the Battle of the Sambre. Uh, which is in the November, which uh, of course finished the war. This is the war when I was four years old, and they were probably pretty fed up with all the men. Most of the men were away, except the miners that stayed at home, of course. But um, austerity was prevalent, and food, though it was not plentiful, they're probably pretty fed up of war diet. But Tradiga being a coal mine in town would have been providing coal for the Royal Navy and for the people to live. In July, preparations were being made for what was known as the Battle of Armines. This was the opening phase of the Allied offensive, which began on the 8th of August, 1918, later known as the Hundred Days Offensive, that ultimately led to the end of the First World War. It was common for tanks to visit British towns to raise money for the war effort. During this time, the British tank named Julian was expected on the 6th of July, but plans had to be altered, and instead the gallant Egbert arrived in Tredegar Station. Scarred from the Battle of Combray, the tank left the train station and was followed by a few thousand people through Morgan Street and as far as St George's Church until resting in the circle near Tredegar town clock. It was a sight the town had never seen the likes of before. They just fought the Battle of Passchendaele where tanks were quite successful and I would presume that they brought around towns like Merthyr Tydfil, Tredegar, Rumleven. Um, just to boost the morale of the, um, of the local populace and to show them a little bit of British Army strength, I should think. That was the Mark IV tank, and um, even though it was a Mark IV, even late on, there were awful things to write about in. And even bullets, as opposed to shell fire, hitting the tank would cause splinters to come off inside, which was very uncomfortable. Also, the fumes were terrible and often men became very sick um, and vomited whilst moving about the battlefield. It would have boosted the morale. The children would have loved to have seen it and um, because there weren't many soldiers home on leave at that time. But it would have been very interesting to the um, civilian population. According to the West Monmouthshire edition of the Merthyr Express, as the hour closing approached, there were scenes of enthusiasm never before witnessed in the town. The great aim was to reach a quarter of a million, and when it was announced to the dense crowd in the circle that the figure had been reached, there was loud cheering. Then the great desire of the promoters was to beat Aberdeer's total, and this was done before the official closing hour, and again there was a tremendous outburst of cheering. Still money was coming in, so that the clerical staff was almost overwhelmed, but they stuck to their task, and when the accounts were closed, the total had reached the magnificent sum 
of £267,390 for the two days, a result which far exceeded the expectations of the most sanguine. Egbert, after its record success in the town, moved off to the station, headed by the town band and escorted by the VTC, under Lieutenant Woley, and accompanied by the densest crowd ever seen in the town. The opening proceedings took the form of a religious service, prayers being read by the Reverend John Evans, Vicar of St. James. The Reverend D. M. Rees delivered a stirring address and said it was the strangest pulpit he had ever preached from. Armenes was one of the first major battles involving armoured conflict and marked the end of trench warfare on the Western Front. By 1918, Britain and France had produced 6,506 tanks. Germany had produced just 20 tanks, but tanks were very slow and could not exceed four miles an hour. It took a long while for them to get used to how to use them. They stuck in mud, they broke down very easily. And um, of course, when they break down, they could become a pillbox, you could still use them. But it was a great advantage. It meant that men could go forward and um, without being killed, or many, many of them were killed. But if you could imagine if they had a Second World War tank, like a chieftain or something, it would have gone all the way to Berlin. But those tanks in those days were pretty primitive. It took a long time for it to make any difference. Um, it, it made a difference towards the end of the war. The noise of them at night and the, um, the, the use of them, because they, they used them wrongly in the beginning of the war, but towards the end of the war, they got more tactical with them and um, it became a great arm of the service and still is an arm of the service even today. The disadvantages are that if they threw a truck, they were stuck there and we lost them. They were very expensive bits of kit. The Germans quickly copied them. Germany learned to deal with World War I tanks very effectively. During the Battle of Armines in 1918, 72% of Allied tanks were destroyed in just four days. Six days before the end of World War I, the British tank corps only had about eight tanks left. A bit of rejoicing, I would have thought, and it also meant that um, because the soldiers that had enlisted very early in the war were miners, they were quickly released, and home they came. And um, I should think joyous, but a lot of sadness, because a lot didn't come back. The visit of Egbert and the support from the people of Tredegar did not end there. Here we see a bonny baby competition in the town park. Each pram ordained with flags of red, white and blue. And of course the marches continued. Chapels from all over Tredega gathered here. Tredegar in those days, even when I was a boy, in the 50s, that we all went to chapel because your mother would be ashamed if we didn't go. And um, each, not every street, but every couple of streets had a chapel. Down in uh, what we call the tip in particular, I went to Bethania. And if I, if I went, I got a slice of uh, apple tart of my grandma. If I didn't go, she gave me a slap on the ear. So, but we rather enjoyed that. But the marches were part of that because every Easter, each chapel would go up and down this road here trying to outsing each other. Um, and they were very good too, especially the women I can remember in those um, marches with their high contralto voices and good Welsh singing. And the bigger the march, the longer the procession, the prouder they were. And the child would dress up in his Sunday best. Even though we dressed rather scruffy in the week, we always had our Sunday best. And little children of five, seven, eight years of age would be seen wearing a tie. 
which you'd ever see today. Well, all the hierarchy from the chapels, the, the preacher and, and, and the um, people who run that particular chapel, but, and uh, that, that was it. The thing to be looked forward to every year. And after you'd finished the march, you went back to your chapel and you had a high tea, lumps of tart and the rest of it. And it was quite a proper thing. And games. Today, the people of Chudiga remember those who have fallen. Well, the first impact that you have to mention is the 420, or, or thereabouts, give it a five or ten, casualties on the town. Some families lost two or three sons. And as my father used to say, he was in that war, and he's a Chudiga boy, he used to say there's a casualty almost in every other house in Chudiga. First of all, there was the British Legion that came along, which were ex-soldiers to go, and they remembered them there. And in Tredegar is one of the finest war memorials in the British Isles. And it's in Tredegar Park, as you know, and the other one, to so the same battalion, the Monbuses, is in uh, Abergavenny. And it's a superb bit of kit, and there's only one monument that almost compares with them, and that's in London, the, the Guards Division. But the Monmouth Regiment got the most superb memorial, and that's what they did it, and they gathered there every year on the 11th of November for their few words and two minutes silence. Many a young man gave his life. The Monmouth Regiment's 3rd Battalion, 3rd Mons, who recruited from the town and the area, were disbanded after suffering heavy losses at Ypres in 1915 and during the Battle of the Somme. Tredegar, like many other valley towns, remember the great sacrifice that our people gave on the battlefields of the First World War. On the monument in Tredegar, the number of names engraved on its base total 303 for the First World War alone. Their names a constant reminder of the men who paid the ultimate sacrifice and will never be forgotten.